I'm not happy. I think I need to move. This isn't working for me. Seeing my wife pregnant and thinking, I don't want to be a miserable dad. So what did you say to your wife on that holiday? Going through pivotal moments in life where we had to ask, is it really worth it? To finding a fusion between humans and machines to create a smart and effective service. That is the most important thing, to have a business where contribution is recognised, rewarded and celebrated. What AI does, it enables you to free your creative teams up to have more thinking time, challenge it more, craft it more. That's where the value comes. Anything's possible. Do the right things, think big. If you're passionate about what you do, you tend to do it better and then you tend to be more successful. Greetings, I'm Ashley Samuels McKenzie. And I'm Charles Parkinson. And welcome to How I Became. Where we unveil the unscripted journeys of inspirational figures. If you enjoy the show, could you do one thing? Subscribe. Wherever you are, just click the subscribe or follow button. That simple act can help us grow the podcast in a big way. And we need your support to do it. And if you really want to help play a part in our growth, rate us on Spotify or leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It would mean the world. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Uber, shaping the future for consumers as they go anywhere and get anything. Advertising on Uber connects brands with hundreds of millions of people using Uber around the world in the moments that move them most. To learn more about what we can do for your brand, visit uber.com forward slash advertising. I'm Matt Kiddy, and this is how I became CEO and founder of the Amigo Partnership. Born into a family of engineers, who would have thought he would choose a career in creative? Seeing truth in the right people make the right culture, a value that holds true and native. Understanding your own value can ensure you never sell yourself short, and he shows you can be part of a winning team, despite not pursuing his early career in sport. Going through pivotal moments in life where we had to ask, is it really worth it? To finding a fusion between humans and machines to create a smart and effective service. We'll strip back and get to the heart of it. Introducing Matt Kiddy, CEO and founder of the Amigo Partnership. Thank you. There no, we go. One's ever, no one's ever written a poem for me. I don't know whether blush or give you a kiss. <laughs> <laughs> Either's fine. <laughs> it is often a first for people on the show to get a poem written for them. Um, and so that is your life as a poem. And in this episode, we're going to share the story of how you became founder and CEO of the Amigo Partnership, um, which is a great story. And I think it's so good for anybody who's either currently a business owner, entrepreneur, mm -hmm. or an aspiring one, because you've done something that is seen as the sort of the big milestone thing to achieve as an entrepreneur. One, you've set up your own company, companies, uh, with your co-founder. But two, you've sold your company, which is a lot of what people, entrepreneurs set out to do is to build it, get, to the, get it to the right place and sell it. And the issue is when you did that, it was a very difficult time and you weren't very happy um, when you did. So that is what we're going to explore is how to, how to, um, what lessons you learned from doing that. And anybody who is, yeah, running a business and looking to sell one day, I think you're an amazing person to listen to on, on how to do it well, how to do it right and how not to do it, um, as well. So that's what's to come. Um, but I hand over to Ash for kicking things off. So how to be an entrepreneur? Well, is an entrepreneur born? Or are they formed from people that they see and things they hear about? How is it for you? I think I got my entrepreneurialism through a number of factors, um, influence of people. So as you just said, you know, grew up in, you know, the, the influences of, you know, engineers, so engineering family. Um, so they weren't entrepreneurs, they were engineers. Well, they were engineers, yeah, 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 good point. No, my dad was certainly, you know, so my uncle and my father were definitely entrepreneurs because they had their own businesses. Okay. Um, what were they? What were the businesses? So they were component, uh, so they engineered component parts for, for um, sports cars, Formula One, touring cars, etc. cetera. Um, we talked about AMG earlier, but they did a lot of work for Brabus. Um, no small teams as well. Anyway, F1 fans here, Williams F1 in peak Williams era as well with 
who is Nigel Mansell. Oh, yeah, exactly. Wow. Nigel Mansell when he won uh, his championship, um, at least one of them, um, is in um, Damon Hill's car as well at when at Williams. He worked with uh, I think Schumacher in uh, when he was in the Jordan Hart and and definitely had a year of fine wins in Jordan Hart as well. So yeah, so that was my dad. Um, so he had a really interesting career. You know, I used to work in you know for him as well you know in school holidays and things like that um you know loved it but you know it's kind of his influence i guess taught me work e work ethic and you know um the entrepreneurial you, you, you can do it you can achieve it you just you know set your goals go do it so you, uh, essentially you saw your dad running his own business and that that was a that became an option i guess well i think it normalized it i think yeah. it, it i don't think there was ever a moment where i you know, thought I want to do that like you've done it, Dad. But I think it made it achievable mm. that you know that normal people can you know set up businesses and be successful. Mm. Um, you know, big influences. My one of my father's friends, a guy called Jonathan Crisp, who um, it was very different. You know, in terms of the way he was as a person, um, he started an agency, ran an agency called Marketing Solutions back in the day. Um, sold it out to Omnicom, was very, very successful. Um, so this, for anybody not in the world of advertising, when you say agency, it was a creative advertising Exactly, agency? a creative agency. So, um, you know, they, they would do advertising, marketing campaigns that, you know, were broader than just advertising. Um, you know, really successful, very interesting guy, had a different view of the world, um, was, was very different to my upbringing, you know, in, in the Midlands. Um, it's, you know, surrounded by kind of engineers, if you like. But you know they associated also with you know very different people. But but he was just like quite an a very inspirational figure because it was like he had a different view, and that uh, was a catalyst for me. It, was, it sparked my curiosity to go you know, mm. um, it, what, how did you become you, and that's cool. I want to do that, mm. and um, and you know my mother was amazing as well. She's like actually, you know, go go do what you need to do rather than going down the, I guess natural path. Um, but yeah, no, it's amazing. So he, you know, was very fortunate. Um, he was very close, you know, back then when I was growing up. Um, he got, I did, I was doing a degree and stuff. And in my sandwich year, he got me a job working in a in an ad agency in in Melbourne, in Australia, working on uh, the Coca Cola account and Mars confectionery of Australia, New Zealand, and China account. And I loved it. You know, this is a a great world where you're dealing with creativity mm. um you know working on amazing brands it, it, for me new cultures you know, coming from the uk so it's just brilliant that's where i got the bug um but so yeah it they've... was this this chap in in london sorry what was his his name jonathan again? crisp jonathan yeah. crisp yeah he was the one who got you this job in 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 uh, australia and um and really yeah inspired you that you didn't have to be an entrepreneur or a business owner in the world of engineering although it would be pretty cool if you were working for Red Bull or Mercedes now. Um, but uh, yeah, it sparked your fascination by this world of advertising and marketing and creative and agencies, which we should say, just a very, we'll get into what is Amigo Partnership in more detail later, but just briefly, what is Amigo Partnership for people who don't know? So Amigo Partnership is a creative agency. We're independent. We deliver brand, strategy, creative, and predominantly digital um, solutions for, for a, an array of clients. Big brands, we should Big say brands, that. Yeah. So yeah. Can you can you name drop a few? Yeah. Um, so we work with the likes of uh, Rio Tinto, QBE, Long Perrier, Live School Media, Virgin Middle East and Africa. Um, and, and, and numerous others. Sorry if I've missed any out there. Really important. And it's a bit of a tricky yeah. question to ask. It's like asking someone to add it. UNICEF. There we go. Nice. Yeah. And that's something we're going to go into later is how to win big blue chip clients as well and how you've done that and what's been successful. But we'll get to that. For now, you your career, we kind of fast track through your career. You didn't go straight into starting a company. You went to Australia, came back to London, and you worked at a couple of independent agencies. You worked at a big, what we call network agency, which is part of a larger group, Ogilvy. Are you thinking at that point, I'm going to start my own agency one day? And 
Well, let's just start there. Is that is that what you're thinking going through your career at this at this point? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, going over, for instance, to going to Australia for the first time was amazing. Um, Melbourne is such a good city. You know, I had a bit of an epiphany there on, you know, what life could be and, you know, wanted to be more curious about traveling the world and whatnot. But um, I was also, just going back a step before going forward, not natural, you know, into coming into this industry or into the creative industry because um you know my kind of education was quite traditional wasn't particularly creative you know all that kind of stuff you know the, the classic did art did this i didn't you know i chased the ball around and then um rugby you almost became a professional rugby player yeah. well i wasn't yeah nearly nearly yeah. i mean got pretty pretty high pretty, level yeah but reality is not not good enough but the um but then coming back so to finish the degree came into london got a job um, at an independent agency called Brewer Blackler working on um, advertising for uh, what was called then One to One. It was now T-Mobile, then mm. morphed into EE. Yeah. Um, so that was really cool. Um, and then got a job, um, moved uh, around a bit, but went to Ogilvy, worked on a premium TV account, which was all the football, uh, basically the football league, the, the Scottish Football League, how... They consolidated all their websites. They had independent websites by football brand, but created the media channel. So that was cool. Mm. Really enjoyed that. Um, and, you know, worked, met some really not cool people. And, you know, at that point, I'm starting, you know, the conversation being had around, oh, you know, we could do this, we could do this. And, you know, th this was, I guess, about five years into, um, you know, in, into the career. Then so came, you're what age at this point? I guess about 25. Five ish, twenty six, yeah, maybe twenty six. So, and then what well, you and f colleagues are going, we could do this. We could do our own agency. Or well, it's more the kind of the classic, you know, um, down the pub with a couple of you know guys. And, and you, what you tend to do is, you, well, you you want to kind of perfect the process of delivery, right? And mm -hmm. you kind of sometimes get frustrated, you know, when um, there's randomness in the process or you don't think it's quite good as it, it should be. And then you, you know, I think it's human nature to have those those, those conversations and, and you'd want to challenge it and, you know, want to put your mark on it and, you know, and, and, and want to do a better job, right? Um, so... We can do better than Ogilvy. It's what you're saying. <laughs> well, it sounds really arrogant, but, but, um, but a lot not of people like do that, think that. Yeah, when yeah. you're in a company, you see all the faults and you think, I could do this. But you do get frustrated, mm. you know, and sometimes when, particularly if you're working in a big machine, there's bureaucracy there that you don't necessarily need. And you sometimes feel, particularly when you're, you know, slightly impetuous that you're taking a step back rather than going forward, you know, and all that mm. kind of stuff. So, um, but then came out of there and the, there was a breakaway that set up a, an independent called Grasshopper. Um, that was great. That's kind of the third person in, not a founder. Um, and, you know, went in as an account director and the that agency you know grew blossomed it's fantastic then you know worked up to being on the board quite early as in young mm. um amazing um founder ceo ceo of that business that you know that taught me a lot actually when i look look back retrospectively a guy called hugh taylor and being part of that and understanding how an agency actually grows mm. you know the pitfalls the challenges you know but the you know, relentless kind of ambition to, to do it for, for all the various reasons, how to build teams, you know, whether that be client service, creative teams, how they should work together uh, and exist together and do, do amazing work. So that was, so you could see it on the inside and be part of it. Um, and then I guess that with the fused kind of childhood of, oh, dad can do it, this can happen. Mm -hmm. Conversations, you know, in the middle, you know, down the pub with Paul Harrison, um my partner and then you know then there was a junction in life when we thought you know what this is the right time so so we, what's we, what's it like at that moment and because there may be people listening who are having those chats down the pub yeah what's what's the but what's the real experience are you, it's not like oh yeah let's just go and set this up tomorrow are you feeling nervous is there trepidation are you concerned about things when you're thinking about going out on your own all those things. I, I mean, in my time of life, it was different for me than it was for Paul. Um, he'd just had a child, um, and there's a pivot point we'll talk about, you know, 
when I just had a child, but he'd just had, I think his first kid and, and went, yeah, yeah, great idea. Yeah, let's do that. And you go, are you mad? <laughs> you know, cause you're trying to build security into your life. Right. And he was working for a big network, but you know, things are happening there and things are happening where I was a uh, grasshopper and it was, you know, we just needed to, you know, it was the right point in time when we had the right kind of mindset and the right ambitions, but I had far less to, to lose you know, in terms of that kind of, you know, the collateral damage that could have been, you know, if you had failure because he's got to support, you know, his young family. So, yeah. And how did you, how did you set yourself up for success? Um, I think it's kind of really, really following your passion, right? We had a, we set a target and that was to, um, to create an agency and do things the way we wanted to do them. And we had a you know belief about bringing the best teams in place, being agile, et cetera, et cetera. We were very lucky um, because at the same time as we had this urge to, to, to do our own thing, um, there was a, a need within a, a network um, uh, called Momentum. It's a big agency, Park McCann. Um, we had the opportunity to go in there, kind of incubate our, our, our baby. How did that happen? So if someone listening to this and going, that sounds like a good plan, I'd like to get incubated. How did you actually orchestrate that to it, happen? It was kind. It was it was complete accident, you know. So um, we'd done a bit of work. Uh, we did some integrated work with Momentum, where they didn't have any digital specialization and wanted to go uh, at this point in time. Um, so you did some work with them as your company or as a it goes grasshopper I see yeah, yeah. so um, we we did You're an integrated employed. piece we pitched for a big piece of work uh, for Boots and it went really well and then we we did a few other kind of bits you know for Intel globally or this and the other so I'd got quite a bit of credibility over there that you know knew what I was on about um, this you know from a, that kind of digital capability perspective and I, I was speaking to a, a who's now a great friend of mine Alan Cobb at the time and saying look i'm not really happy doing this and i've got this urge to you know um set up a business with paul partner um and he then pathwayed us to go right if you're going to do that we want you on the inside of here because you can help us while you do your thing um which is really so good who was this person sorry a oh, guy called alan cobb great guy and he yeah. was your boss he was who, who no, was he, he? he was a, a counterpart so i used to work with that well i met al when he was um, he was senior at Momentum at the time, went on to run it, um, and then you know be senior McCann stuff. He um, pathwayed. He, there's a guy running it at the time called John Armstrong. Um, sadly passed away. Great guy, and he'd pathway weighed it with John to say, look, we need this central specialisation because they were quite a fragmented business in terms of back then that just. Uh, bought a few shops, merged them together, had you'd kind of frag fragmented yet complementary disciplines you know, across mm. retail, sponsorship, field marketing, and something else I can't remember right now. Yeah. But um, uh, and what they were doing at the time is they were they were kind of adding on digital as part of their service offering, but it was all again didn't have a central kind of point of view um, in terms of strategy, you know, being strategic. It was more tactical and then they were you know on a commercial basis they didn't have any kind of economies of scale coming out one central point so you know we went in and did that um so would you recommend mm. that for someone who yeah, likes the idea of sort of setting up as an incubation to have a chat with someone in the organization saying look i'm not really happy doing what i'm doing but i do want to start a business and just exploring whether there's options to do something like you've done I, I definitely think so. I mean, you've got to choose who you're going to speak to, um, you know, retrospectively, you know, actually going and speaking to, you know, McCann business is probably not a natural way to go about things, but it was just very fortuitous that new influential people there and the timing was perfect. So for, for us, it was, it was potentially lucky rather than designed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, but there is a, I think, you know, if, this is self-reference, but if a team came to us and said, "Look, we, we we are you know we offer this value, we're different to what you offer service offering wise. Can you bolt us in? You know, our future prob probably is elsewhere, 
but it, you never know. I think I'd be all over that to go, yeah, new talent, new views, new capability. If you can bolt that into your, you know, into your service offering to add, you know, additional value to your client base, then it, I think it's a bit of a no brainer. Mm. Okay. And how, how do you start a company? Some listening go, cool, right. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to be inspired by Matt and I'm going to start my company. How do you do it? Yeah. Have a dream, a passion, whatever you want to call it. Be clear about your value proposition um, and so why you're going to be different. Under, try and define your purpose as part of that as well and connect it to what the buyer will buy, clients, what they're interested to. Understand, obviously, the competitive landscape and you know where, where and how you're going to differentiate yourself because no one wants the same as everything else. Mm. And, then, and then go for it, you know, but really, you know, just be clear about what you're trying to achieve and be clear why that's going to be different, why that's going to be, you know, kind of listened to. Because the hardest thing is to just get through the door, you know, of clients. Um, but clients want an edge all the time. So just be really clear about that, what, what that edge is, and then go after it. Mm. So that's what you did, I guess. You had those conversations, you set your vision, you set your unique proposition, you got set up, incubated within the organization. What happened next on the, in the story? So we were quite successful there um, in terms of growing revenue for, for, for that business. Um, and, and at the time, we we'd won a few of our own clients and, and, and started building the team. And then they, um, they out, out of the US, they bought a, a digital shop to bolt in and add scale as, as networks do. So we said, okay, guys, that's us that's, that's done then. Um, but in a nice way, it was really positive. And they, they helped us and we continued doing some, some work for them as well. So, you know, you could prop up some of the costs, obviously, the re you know, revenues required. And then we got our own, you know, our own, our own space in Farringdon, a big leap of faith. You know, kind of a few uh, sleepless nights when you're taking on a load of overhead directly. Talk to us about that because I think this is the thing that stops a lot of people because it's that fear of responsibility and the unknown that often people don't make that transition to actually go out and start alone. Um, how did you get over that? Oh, at the time, I think I was just headstrong. You know, I mean, this was a long time ago now, like Agency One. Um, and yeah, I was just, just determined, you know, didn't even think about it. We're doing that. What would you say to someone who's saying, like, oh, I'm interested in starting one, but, you know, what about all the costs? Like, yeah, we've got to pay for an office and we've got to hire staff. And what if we don't bring the money in? And I've got a kid as well and all these things. What would you say? Be good at maths. Uh, because yeah so i think you've got to be a calculated risk taker so don't do anything that is too high risk understand you know the risk spectrum um you know you've got to offset that with obviously your drive your passion you know and, and where you think is right for a business to, to to launch and then you just got to be quite pragmatic about it and go you know what is the right time to take on cost um it is always you know, in terms of growing a business, the the biggest your handbrake that you know you, are, you there, there is a natural kind of fear of going too far with your cost base because you can't sometimes, particularly when you, your your agency is or business is um, is new, because you've got no pipeline visibility. So it's mm. you're taking incremental leaps of faith, and then because you're small and you're hands on. You know, as a team, then you're operating in 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 kind of peaks and troughs because you know when you win the work, you're doing the work. Mm -hmm. and then you deliver the work and go, where's the next work? And then you go new business, you know, business development to get the next work. Then you do the work and you go, oh, where are we? Do and then so then you've got to go from that into kind of that, and and that means then taking the step back, scaling up, so you're not always hands on, and you then are looking at, you know being on the business not being in the business and then looking at you know uh, pipeline delivery and that is the classic thing that roller coaster of we know from experience you get busy with the work you do the work nobody's doing new business you're not going out to events you're not meeting people you're not doing outbound and suddenly oh where's the money going to be coming you have to yeah. go and do that 
is that is that just an inevitable path at the beginning you think just you need to go through or is there ways to avoid going through that do you should you avoid going through that okay survey of one um or two actually because you've been through the same thing i, th I think you know hindsight you, you've got to have some discipline to step off a bit and not do you know always be in the work and be doing the work because you've got to be horizon mm -hmm. planning you know from, from a business development perspective from a scaling perspective from a, you know meeting talent you know when they can be onboarded and all that kind of stuff um so that you know that requires a bit of discipline because you know the you're pulled into you know doing the work particularly if you want to keep the the overhead down so it's a difficult balance but at some point you've got to take the leaps of faith um to, to move the business forward because there's certain you know difficult points one is you know um launching the business because then you've got the trepidation of you know taking that leap you know for Paul and I and um you know that, that was quite a, you know difficult yeah, a lot of difficult decisions for him difficult decisions for me because coming away from the security of a per permanent job and then obviously fear of failure and stuff but um but you just go and then you're determined so that's you know a really difficult part then the next one is you know as you said it was we're talking about now is like when you do start getting the re you know the, the the projects in the clients and you're winning it's then you've got to go you've got to make sure that you're servicing them right you're delivering quality but you're looking for the next job and then it's all about kind of extending pipeline and visibility so you've you, you are making the business as sustainable as possible mm -hmm. in you know for the the the, the short medium and long term and what were some of the best ways that you used to increase that pipeline and gain more clients? Networking. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it, it it's as basic as keeping in touch with clients when you're working with them in whatever pr prior to or during, uh, doing the best job you can, earning trust, um, being someone and a, and a service they can lean on. Uh, try and be as frictionless as possible as in an enabler not a you know part of the problem your solution and then build relationships um uh, from I, I personally think that is the the key thing could be you know particularly in yeah we do quite a lot of new business development now we're pitching a lot at the moment but the but the premise is exactly the same in that you land it you deliver quality work, you stay in your swim lane, you do the job, you excel at the job, and then you start talking about potentially other things based on a foundation of credibility and, and results. Any tips for how you would network and any advice there? Um, I think just be accessible as possible, you know, um, try and you know walk the floors as much as you can you know in terms of we're in a different world now where you know meetings aren't as prevalent you know in terms of back in the day I'd, I'd always try and be in the client's office you know talking to people making you know connections um and you never know when that can spark a conversation about a problem they've got a challenge that's quiet you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and then that's the perfect opportunity to to then you know offer a solution to that or point of view on it build a cred your credibility or give a response sort of stroke proposal you know we live in a world now where meetings are less frequent as in you know because you know a lot of people are hybrid and obviously team zooms whatever um is, is is prevalent as well so but but yeah it's just about keeping relationships you know going so we're not actually we're not talking about the amigo partnership here we're talking about your first business and you obviously do very well because you get to this position as i mentioned earlier where you're ready to to sell the business um which is a, a milestone as i said a lot of people would love to achieve and set out to um tell us the story of how how that unfolds how you even were you looking for someone to buy it how you found them do you do you go to the local corner shop and put a little image in the in the in the, in the, in the corner shop window saying agency for sale <laughs> we're sure some agencies have been sold like yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i'll do next um good idea the it's quite creative yeah. <laughs> like that. Old school. Um, so again, 
factors of circumstance, I guess. So, you know, we'd done a good job of, you know, scaling the business to a to a, to a certain level. We'd met a guy uh, called Jamie Parker, um, who then, you know, we became he became part of us. And we had this agency called Coda Digital, and we we're doing amazing work uh, for some amazing clients. You know, doing a lot of digital advertising work for uh, Financial Times, Eurosport, Discovery Channel, Puma, and more, mm. um, LG Mobile, etc. And you know, we we're doing a fantastic job. So we'd gone into there was a p- kind of an opportunity to go into a, b- a boutique network um, at the time called the Contact Group, and that was founded by a guy called Ian Sanderson, who had very successfully built an agency, you know, back in the day called Dynamo. And Ian had come up with this kind of idea, you know, with the other founders of the group, whereby you could um, plug in agency discipline specialisms. So you've got, you know, sponsorship, you've got retail, you've got experiential, you've got digital, you've got print, I think that was the, the uh, you've got DM and you've got promotion. So we had the opportunity to go in there as a digital agency. And, and the premise was, um, if you get, you know, so an agency is valued on its yeah, ver- various things, but, you know, in a crude sense on, on its uh, revenue and, and, and EBIT. So w- what's its driving from a, the gross uh, revenue perspective, and then you've got your o- operator profit or EBITDA. Um, and then off the back of that, you have a multiple, you know, so you'd be valued on a multiple of whatever that number may be based on other factors like, you know, what's been bought in the market, how strong is your management team, what's the structure of your client base, what's your point of difference, blah, blah, blah. And then. So these are all the things that they're looking for when they're looking to to buy an agency or a company yeah in a, in a simplistic in, in simplistic terms yeah. yeah so but the the why i'm saying that is because then if you put together a network a boutique network where you've got cause a lot of it's about critical mass if mm. you take one component one agency the multiplier could be lower yeah so you the valuation and offer smaller number valuation lower well, what's the uh, average multiplier for an individual so well, right now it's probably about six, seven, I think. Okay. It, it really depends. Depends where you are, um, you know, on the, you know, how big you are, what's your point of difference, etc. But going back to the contact group, there, the rationale there was to have, if you've got, you can build critical mass by plugging together complementary agencies. Mm-hmm. You can offer a service to bigger clients because you've got a integrated service offering. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then on a business level, you can increase your multiplier because you've got more of a unique proposition and you've got more critical mass. Mm. So it makes sense on an individual level as well as a on a, on, on a group level. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. yeah. And what's the difference? So if it's six or seven, if you're an individual agency, what would it be as a group on average? It's hypothetically, it could be eight or nine. You know, okay. there's no... Yeah, in any given time, you have to look at what's happening in the market, what are the market conditions... And how unique you know you are, how um, you know what your client base it, you know is, how's that contracted, you know retainer versus project, what your um, your your historic trading performance has been, what does that look like from a projection perspective, what's your management team like, you know there's a lot of different lenses that need to be put on it, so it's, it's very difficult to say it's, it's A or B, you mm. know, there's many factors. And can we just put some numbers as an example? So, what some uh, what give us some an example of an EBITDA and the multiples, and then what that all that what that means? Just breaking it down really simply. So, if you've got in in really easy mathematical sense, so if you if you're if you are running a business of one million um, gross profit, you should be around twenty two percent, twenty eight percent ish margin. Therefore, you're going to get Let's call it two hundred twenty thousand pounds of EBITDA. Then say you get a multi. And anyone who's confused about EBITDA, what is that? To explain. That is, uh, it is earnings before interest, tax, and something else. But it's basically profit before tax. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. 
So yeah, carry on the calculation. Um, and then you would times that by your multiplier. So you've got, two, let's call it 200, because that's easy for my, my, my terrible maths. Times five equals it'd be worth a million pounds. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If the multiplier was five. So that's how, how it works. How we got down this rabbit hole, I don't know. So I'm so, sorry about that. It's good. But, it's a, but, yeah. Basically, this is a breakdown for anybody yeah. who's interested in selling their company one day or even they're starting their company. It's just, I think, really what this is helpful for um, is yet to tell. They just want to learn from your journey and experience of doing it. Um, so this is helpful in that way. Yeah. Um, and we're so going through this on. now at the moment, actually. So in terms of, you know, wh where we need to look at our business, it's not just about, you know, growth, driving numbers, you know, actually. And, and, and this is a bit of advice, actually. Don't be transactional. Be value and quality driven. Uh, be really passionate about what you're trying to achieve and do great work the numbers will look after themselves. So, mm. you know, being too transactional, you, you step away from really understanding um, or being purpose-driven. So there, there, there are two ways, obviously, being, you know, a, a business or business leader, transactional is very commoditized. Purpose-driven is all about, you know, really driving quality product. Mm. Mm. Okay. So, yeah, continue on the, the, the story of, uh... of that. So contact group, great premise, um, really bought into the people. Um, slight fly in the ornament was it was it was recession two. I think that was around 2008-ish. Um, and we were doing well. A couple of agencies went down. Composition of that group changed. So you'd sold to this group at this yeah, point? Yeah, so we're, we're rolling up. Yeah. Um, so how, you, how did you feel when you sold the company? What a great achievement. Yeah, yeah. No, yes. And and you know why I'm hesitating there. But the so the yes. So at that, genuinely at the when it was done at the beginning of selling it, how did you feel before we? Oh, fantastic! Because because you know we had a it was set ourselves a goal to join this group where we're stronger together, we're getting more value together. The you know the good people, all that kind of stuff, and it makes perfect sense. Um, and then and you make some money surely through it as well. Made some money, yeah. yeah. Made some money. So how that works, you know. Yes, so made some money. So that was good, um, all good. But then, you know, because of the composition change in that structure of that business, you know, and and how they and how that that group then wanted to morph into not being a you know necessarily a boutique network. It wanted to become more of a sports marketing business, which made absolute sense because a lot of the you know the commercial uh, value was there, but that then to get to where you know the point is in in this particular pivot was um you just uh, yeah it wasn't what i wanted set the scene for us because you you've sold your company but you're still still running it obviously you've got some money in the bank now um you're on holiday you're in corfu sun is shining you've got a child by this point or your wife's pregnant wife's pregnant wife's pregnant you know, come on, live in the dream. You've exited, but you're running a company that you love. You're on holiday, everything's good. Um, but how are you feeling inside? So we'd just been married, uh, you know, short space of time, we just bought a house, done it bought up. house too. Oh, done it yeah, up. It, done it up. And, you know, no, on a small level. And, and we, you know, we were in our favorite place in Corfu, you know, modest place but you know love Corfu and I'm in the pool I look around to my my new wife pregnant and I realized I wasn't very happy you know had all this amazing stuff all these things that were making me so happy on, on one side of things um but I knew that I wasn't happy on my work side of things and and you know had a bit of a moment penny drop moment um when and it was fueled by, I just, you know, seeing my wife pregnant and thinking, I don't want to be a miserable dad. And I'm quite a basic human being. You know, I just know I like to bounce out of bed, be driven on what I think is right, and and then crack into that. And then, you know, when things aren't right, they surface pretty quickly. They unsettle me. Um, How would you feel at that time when you woke up out of bed for 
ready for work that day. Just sluggish. You know, what are the thoughts going on? What are the, what are the inner chatter going on in your head? Just going through the motions, you know, going through the motions, not nec- not thinking the agency is going in the right direction. You know, we, we'd, the, 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 you know, the, the reason, the fundamental diff- or drivers behind feelings that we get to in a second were, um, you know, we'd gone from, and then, you know, this is a state the obvious, you go from running the business, being totally in control of the business, whatever happens with that business, you know, away from delivering what you contract to do for your clients, you have obviously full control of. Um, when you sell your business, you do not. You know, you have a voice on a board, um, but, you know, it, it might be a minority one. So, mm. you know, you're not in control anymore, um, obviously. Which, but, I but, guess you're not thinking about that when you sell. No. You're just thinking, this is great. You know, we get all these benefits. And- well, exa- exactly. So, again, setting your targets, you, sometimes you've got to, you know, see round and think round, you know, what a particular target is. And you get to, a, you know, a junction in life and then you, you, you then live it. And then, you know, if there's a disjoint there, it's very difficult for, you know, someone like me because I, I can't, I, I don't deal with it very well. You know, I just want to do what I think is the best thing to do for me and the business and what and, you love as well and what yeah exactly i mean that's it. it's what you love um and i can't just be in the hamster wheel just cracking on that's not me um so what did you say to your wife on that holiday do you remember so, so i had yeah the, the 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 revelation in my own mind that you know i wasn't happy and i said you know i said to her look this is not ideal but you know i don't think i can i fit there so i need i need change um and you know the background to that is you know the composition of that business was changing it was you know very, they were scaling to to then go into an event which is cool but that meant profit for people um where our business would go would be more department rather than standalone specialist mm-hmm. agency that didn't sit well at all with me um i didn't think it was right for our clients um, I thought we'd lose our competitive edge. And so, you know, something needed to be done. And all these things were in my head. You know, I'd got had all these other life events going on as well, but I just knew I I had the potential to be that miserable father. Maybe I'm there now. But the uh, but at that point in time, I so I don't want that. You know, this is gonna be a huge event for, you know, with 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 a child coming in. I wanna be positive of mindset, not not negative of mindset. So Alice was amazing. Um, uh, she's, yeah, my wife. So she's been amazing twice. You know, when I have had these counterintuitive conversations and then she's very much been just go and do what you need to do, uh, which is fantastic. Um, Even more so because you're saying basically you want to stop doing this thing that's that's bringing in money and everything and you've got a child on the way and you want to take a risky move what are you what are you suggesting to her to her that you do at this point i didn't quite know and that crystallized quite quickly after the holiday um at this point i said look i'm i'm, I'm not happy i think i need to move um i don't know how that looks yet but this isn't working for me and so she was hugely supportive of that. So it's more emotional than actually working it out practically yeah. at this point. Um, and then um, I came back, had a beer with my partner. Well, of course, you've partner, got a Paul. business partner. Yeah. So he could be having a great time and you've got to go and tell him, sorry, mate, I'm not actually enjoying this. That must have been a bit nerve wracking to have that well, conversation. We, yes and no. He, he's lovely. You know, we, we have a great relationship, very honest transparent relationship so you tend not to see too much from you know t- not a lot comes from left field but um so I, I went back and dropped this and said mate this is not cool in you know f- for me at the moment and he was he said well you should say that i'm exactly the same place oh so, yeah, yeah. he was so, feeling the same yeah so so that was reassuring and then and out of that you know we you know became the the genesis of of Amigo partnership and what that represents. So we 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 we, we exited there. Um, but and- hold on a minute. How do you handle that? Because you've got people that you've said, look, yeah, we're selling to you. 
we're in this for the long term probably i guess you said that and this is the this is how we're going how do you handle such a difficult conversation well the i mean it was difficult and it wasn't straightforward um and you know yeah it wasn't difficult sorry it was difficult so the again you've got kind of a number of layers i mean so the first layer is people so the the business the environment the business was in was a good environment so there was no kind of guilt around exiting because they had decent management structure and all that kind of stuff the doing it as in how do you exit far more difficult uh that's for another podcast and then but the you know we did um we we did a lot of gardening um for a while and and then you know in that time how long did you have to is this gardening league yeah yeah, gardening? yeah i think it was about nine months oh it's it's a fair time of reflection yeah fair time of reflection garden must have been pretty good after it's that it's only a small one but <laughs> <laughs> lots of paint a house from top to bottom though um but yeah it was interesting times yeah a lot of yeah reflection introspection also brilliant to clear you know clear the cash of the mind mm. um and and go again uh, particularly around the time of having a child um so interesting you say that because we another episode we had was with james denton clark who's now ceo of such and such he had six months of gardening leave it's the exact same thing he said cash and the minds got cleared um so it's quite interesting to to hear you both say that and and sounds like it's really what it does do for you to take that time off yeah it was it was great i mean he was I'm going to contradict myself now it was concerning because you come out of a secure from a monetary perspective environment you know how it works because you put it together you you know you're familiar with the people familiar with the processes etc et and then you've got you painting a room thinking about next with no financial security and but it was great for you've got an identity issue at this point as well mm. because you're you've just exited this you know your baby handed it over in a way that you then realize it's quite love that yeah mm. but i wanted to doing that you know um any so, any sorry any advice for anybody who's going through something similar they maybe have sold the company or they have to go on gardening leave looking back was mm. there anything you do differently or anything you did that worked well i think i'd probably be a little bit more articulate with the group company about i'll share my feelings earlier mm. rather than bottle them and then uh because i had so much going on in my personal life as well i probably i probably should could have long viewed them with with people and maybe that would have added you know that would have created layers of reassurance or whatnot but ultimately i don't think it would have changed the outcome mm. so and also sometimes you don't you need to keep your cards quite close to your chest for legal reasons um so yeah, I mean, I think, again, the advice around that, that is, you know, if people are going through it now is just do it eyes, eyes wide open in that, you know, it is obvious. But when you sell your business, that business is not yours anymore. Mm -hmm. That, you know, you will go through a, you know, a, a possibly an earn out. Um, and you, again, you need to understand within that earn out that, that, you know, you are now part of a bigger machine, you know, you, so you're not going to be potentially the, the decision maker you know you might be you know in a wider you know most likely group board scenario where um yeah you're just one voice mm. well two voices as Paul mm. so you know what not but yeah um but that that process was was great in that I did have time away I did clear the cash um and, and that was a, a mental reset which was really good it, it provided clarity around taking the you know what we knew was wrong you know where we were and what we wanted to achieve next which was amigo partnership and the philosophy about that um was all about being client first people first mm. so so is this you did what you did before you started your first company which is called kodu yep. kodu digital yeah, kodu yeah. Digital. um where you set out okay for this new company this is our vision, this is our philosophy, this is what makes us unique. You went through your same process, I guess. Yes, I mean, the there's a morph from Rainmaker into Code is short, and then that's kind of, it doesn't matter. The the, the way we went with, 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 with Amigo partnership was very much around, you know, 
what is the purpose of it? And, you know, the purpose was all, you know, about being people and client first. Um, it was about, you know, as opposed about, to what? Well, you can be very, as I say, you, you know, previously you can be quite transactional or you can be purpose driven. So we wanted to be a more purpose driven agency. And, 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 and that's all about, you know, building culture, building teams, et cetera, um, putting the purpose and the product at the forefront. You've got to do that, I think, to be successful anyway, to find that gap in the market, to mm -hmm. find that differentiating point. You can't be a transactional, you know, me too, um, because in that, in that space, you're, it's, it's a cost thing, you know, et cetera, rather than, yeah, I mean, it's cost and quality, but it's not purpose and differentiation. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, yeah. yeah. Um, so that was cool. So, you know, Migo, um, you, you know, in the, in the kind of formative kind of, point around the brand amigo means friend partnerships mean you know means collaboration so a friend the you know the, the premise behind it was a friend will always go the extra mile for you client first friend will also occasionally have to say you don't want to hear this but mm. um so it's having the that council and then a partnership is all about how do you work together share your experience mm. um you know the three of us here you guys have experience that I don't have, I'll have experience you don't have, but if we can put that together, then we're better for it. Mm. So that that's the premise behind, you know, the brand as it, we started it. It has morphed into, you know, other other things that we, we'll talk about later, but but that's what that, that was the foundational philosophy mm. bit behind the business. You set up this new agency, and at one point you get a call from a previous client yeah. talking to you about a pitch that you'd done months before. Share a little bit about what happened next with us. Yeah, I mean, this is a amazing piece of kind of history to the business, but also just for very fortuitous in that, you know, previously we'd gone and pitched for a um, big piece of work for Jabra, who are a Danish um, brand. They were, they were, at this point in time, they were like, heavily into Bluetooth, I think number one Bluetooth manufacturer, but generally for um, kind of car kits and workplace stuff. But they were pivoting into into a lifestyle product set um, in you know ear stereo earphones and I you know either buds or over the ear, and so previously we'd, we'd you know at Kodu we'd, we'd pitch for this work and the marketing director it's good you know we'd worked together years ago on one to one T Mobile, mm -hmm. we were we were close going back to networking keeping up you know and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff, good friends now um, and 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 whatnot as in peers, we'd keep in touch share information help. Um, anyway, so she was marketing director when, when we pitched them, I guess, 12 months previous. It was a long amount of time, definitely over the nine month garden leave and, uh, and, uh, and all that legal stuff. And, um, anyway, she calls and says, good, it's been a while. Um, good news. Um, uh, you've won this pitch. Um, do you remember that way back when? So, I, ah, that is good news. However, um, yeah, we don't we don't work there anymore, <laughs> uh, and uh, well, we, we've just set up this like startup agency called Amigo Partnership, and um, totally understand if you know if you know it goes elsewhere. Sorry about this, and you know this news. And so Suzanne was amazing. She said, "Look, can you do it? Yes, we can. So yeah, we've got this. You know, we." put all the strategy and the ideas together for the pitch, whatnot, that we, yeah, we're capable of doing. Um, and then we just need to scale the business, get the right teams in, da 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 easy, you know, that, that, that's fine. And so she took a bit of a leap of faith for getting us in, and we won that work. So amazing. it was an amazing piece of work because it was a really nice, meaty, you know, big, beautiful case study um, because it was launching their stereo product range globally. So we came up with the the creative platform idea. So all the messaging that sat behind it, et cetera, et cetera, the visual, you know, identity of it, you know, all the the the, the global advertising, digital assets, retail assets, whatever assets, toolkit. Um, so yeah, amazing piece of work. And we did a variety of other things as well, you know, for Jabra, which is great, um, you know, in, influence the space or whatnot, whatnot. So that was amazing because that gave us the a really good you know, sizable piece of business to then foundation, you know, grow, you know, in terms of teams, create more of a long view, 
Mm -hmm. um, did dip off a bit though. Should have gone up like that because um, we were too into it. Um, and yeah, and then we had a tangible reference point on how our agency does work. Mm -hmm. We've done this and it's good. So that was great because then you can kick the doors in with that and, and show what we've just done. And it, it's a sizable, impressive piece of work. So that was amazing. It's a bit difficult. I'm trying to think how you know people can can use that model because it's um, yeah we're into a sort of a certain. Area. Is there any advice you can share on that going from working at a big agency to going out alone and getting that first client? Are there ways to do it that um, it work well? It's not easy. Again, there's a couple of factors. I guess that you know, depend on how long you've been working in in the industry. You know, the longer you work in the industry, the more contacts you have. Mm -hmm. You know who you know, who you know what makes them tick, what they need, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then you obviously give them a, a point of view and help them. You know, in in their challenges, their ambition, deliver against their ambitions, etc. Um, you know, away from that, in terms of new new business development, you know what 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 we find works is to go low volume high value so what i mean by that is you know just don't scatter gun and send spam everybody you know just understand a brand or business for what it is have a point of view on why you think you know they could do better in a certain channel or whatever and then give them that point of view you know and, and also give them insight so it's you know it's, it's fine having a it's not fine actually having a subjective point of view because anybody can do that but if you deliver insight and validate and evidence why you know you think you can move from x to to, to y that's the, that's the way to have the conversation that's what we, we do so you know as a business we're all about you know evidencing and delivering insight mm, okay got it so yeah you go on this this journey to uh, growing your company that you're still running today, Amigo Partnership, is going very well. Um, and you break through a milestone, I think, is a ceiling for a lot of business owners. And we've got a couple of questions on that. So first, describe what is the issue with getting above the £1 million turnover? It's it, it seems to be a ceiling in the agency kind of world where breaking through that £1 million it's quite a difficult thing. And I'm sure most industries have that number, whatever mm. it is. It be, yeah. might be a different number for a different industry, but there'll be a certain ceiling that just businesses tend to hit as they're, as they're sort of starting out. Exactly. And, and a lot of it comes down to, you know, the overhead you're carrying, how mm. comfortable you are. You know, it's, it's obviously easier to manage a lower overhead, right? Um, and fewer jobs. But then you need, you know, processes and systems that can that can scale through mm. and and you need to be um you know delivering from a performance basis the right amount of margin therefore profit that can be reinvested into talent or systems etc to then be able to kick 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 through it you need quite a, you know you need to be again building those pipelines having the visit you know building the the, the visibility etc and, it, and it's all managing you know, overhead with ability to, to generate more revenue, service more revenue, because obviously, obviously the, you know, headcount is a factor of being able to service revenue. If you've got less people, you have to, you know, you can have a load of kind of ninjas and, and you have a higher um, gross profit per head output, but, but there are certain kind of ceilings around that as well depending on your business model type. So it's just getting those fine balances and, and being able to have the right amount of uh, opportunity. So pipeline throughput to then layer on, servicing the, your clients that you've established well. So they're retained, but you're driving organic revenue growth through them as well by proving that you're good, delivering results, and then being value additive and extending out potentially into different service areas that, that are complementary to what you're doing and native mm -hmm. to your, your service delivery. And and, yeah, and these and are it, ways to break through this barrier, are they? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And Just also it's sometimes it's being kind of brave around going for higher value client, for higher value work. So um, 
the, the, you know, this the similar amount of effort goes into a small budget that it does into a big budget, for instance, you know, in a kind of simplified manner. Mm. So again, it's about where you put your effort as well. And then you try and get more upstream and do the, the bigger, bigger jobs that, that have the bigger revenue number that then you can build your teams around. Um, but, you know, making sure that, that you are cognizant of, of margin and always defending your margin because that buffer delivers profit. But, it, you know, but as you're scaling delivers you the ability to then invest in talent, invest in systems, mm. invest in, in different things that you need to to be able to be able to scale. Mm. I like that. OK. Um, and so you break through the million turnover and, and ha what's what's the journey next on the Imigo partnership? Story? So we now are um, just on 30 people um, doing some amazing work with with some amazing um, with amazing clients. You know, we are we've got, you know, one of the coming out of COVID. It was a bummer for everybody. We had, yeah, you know, there's another pivot around, you know, reflection and, you know, what we need to do um, to kind of reignite the, the business. And at that point, it was very much around, you know, building a new management team. So we've got an amazing management team in place, six people, um, highly capable, energetic, knowledgeable, cohesive. So that was the first bit. So then, you how, know. How do you, if if I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, hmm, new management team sounds, based on everything you shared as well, sounds like that would be a smart thing to do. What was your process? How did you approach it? How did you decide which roles we need, which ones we don't need? and who to get for them and what they need to show. Well, the, f the first area was actually, again, you don't want to go down the COVID rabbit hole, but the a bit of reflection and realizing actually, what are we good at? What are we bad at? Mm -hmm. You know, and, uh, and, and then, you know, building, you know, senior structure around what we're bad at, <laughs> you know, so mm -hmm. get what people. What was that? Um, it, again, you got, we talk about, you know, kind of, you have your self-critical mass, and you know you, you you've you're good at certain one is good at certain tasks, and and over time you realise that you're either not passionate about it or actually pretty bad at it, and then so filling those talent gaps, or you know, is critical to get a cohesive team, and um, uh, you know this is self-reflection, but the taking a bit of a more of a step back and being challenged and just going actually and, and this is this is important actually it's not not a recent thing but it, it's a previous thing and it, but i think it's a really important thing for for any leader in in a business sense is to go you don't have all the answers you can't so don't think you can be comfortable with that and then surround yourself with people that can have the answers and then you build the answer together, you know, mm. and and then to empower, step away and empower and be a stronger team together. Um, and that's what we're all about now. So, you know, we've got great talent, um, not just the leadership team, brilliant talent. So it's all about now, um, or what we've, the last journey for the last two years coming out of COVID is about creating, repurposing ourselves, um, and being really proud about our work coming out of kind of, COVID was quite transactional because you're trying to keep the lights on. Then you go, right, well, that doesn't work. Let's reignite it, change it all up, go again on a on a different you know, kind of path, and bring everybody. Well, actually, everybody contributes and everyone goes together, um, and be really proud of that. And now we're at another pivot point. Um, but now, you know, once talking about that, um, it's you know just p putting an environment in place where you know you've got diversity of people whether that be on a age level whether that be on a cultural level but everybody is empowered to have an opinion i mean everybody has an opinion right but listen to you know mm -hmm. and can contribute to a change of idea you know etc etc so it for us that is the most important thing to have a business where contribution is recognized or listened to recognized rewarded and celebrated and without sounding too twee i think we're doing the best work or you know i'm in an environment now where we're doing the best work we've ever done 
um, which is great. It's down to them, not me. So yeah, it's exciting times. And you know, where we go next, um, there's, you know, again, we're in a, <laughs> a position of flux again, ever, ever changing, but I think that's really important as a, as a business and, and an individual. Um, you know, we've got the advent of the fourth industrial revolution, you know, with, with AI, and you know that you can do you know a number of things with that you can wait um and see if you know if you know what happens you know but we've got a point of view that it's going to have a you know a profound in a pos in terms of positive effect mm -hmm. on on the creative industry so we're now all let's about dive into that because yeah. i want to go back to where this moment changed because this is the sort of next section of this um which is uh a topic everybody is talking about yeah. um and we haven't actually talked about much on this show. And you have made the decision really to integrate AI in a big way into your company. Um, not just download a new tool somewhere or it's a, it's a big shift. Talk, go back to where this, this began, this, this idea to do this or inciting incident. So last year, uh, as a business, you know, we would be talking about AI, doing workshops, etc. Um, we have cool shit sessions in here. We, we, mm. we did quite a bit, you know, around AI. Personally, I, I went on a course that was amazing. Uh, Goldman Sachs um, 10K SB uh, course at uh, University of Oxford Side Business School. What does that mean, 10K SB course? Uh, it, it's, it, it's a course that's developed for... Um, small businesses so that is uh, qualifying is you've got to be over three years old under 15 million revenue mm -hmm. and it is to work with businesses that, that have the ability to scale and therefore can contribute to economic growth yeah uh, etc so that's what goldman that's why goldman do it um you do it at uh the side business school so you're you've got amazing uh, academic plus real growth you know people that have been there done it um, entrepreneurs of you know scale businesses um, and you we had the opportunity to you know you go through this process where you put together a growth plan that's the output of it that then takes your business to the to the ne you know where, where to next and it was really good because again you you know when you're building a business running a business it's organic. Um, you might not. Uh, there's so many diff different important pillars that you that should be in place, you know, with a business. Um, but you might go, "Wow, well, that'll do. That's important." And and it's all about getting the right, you know, kind of graphic equalizer to the right level, if you like. Mm -hmm. Show me age. Um, and 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 that gave us the op going through that process gave us an opportunity or gave me the opportunity to go understand you know, what are the big forces out there in terms of going to impact markets? So it, to me, in that process, I had a very clear penny drop moment. Again, this is the opinion of one, um, that, and, but it, that AI is gonna have a profound effect on, on our business, yeah? Why? Uh, because they, they're gonna be, you know, tech, you know, tech emergence, um, you know, from a creative perspective that, that, that will have a different point of view, maybe be more competitive. Mm -hmm. You've got um, how we need to think about the structure and organization of our business in a, in a new era. You've got then the point of view of, you know, what do clients need? And then in, in this market, well, where we are now, you know, and obviously the world of uncertainty and all this kind of stuff and economic, whether it be economic, political, environmental, etc um uncertainty you know cmos are yeah under the hammer you know around delivering efficiency effectiveness and return on investment whilst trying to scale their brands sales or whatever it may be depending on what their objectives are but the so so what we you know the, the output of that or the the kind of the idea that came, what stimulated, that the course stimulated basically a pivot for us to go, right, AI is here. It's not necessarily washed through right now. It hasn't washed through the, the industry right now. Is it an opportunity? Is it a threat? What are we going to do about it? And so we decided to kind of face into that headwind 
and go right actually we see this as a massive opportunity because um we are and be really clear you know we are not a tech business we will never be a tech business um but the but what we can do is we can use ai to supercharge our our process so we we talk about having an augmented create now talk about having an augmented creativity process so what does that mean it means fusing carefully choreographing human talent intuition curiosity everything that's human craft with ai and what ai does it enables you to um speed up process get a richness of of information that can fuel the creative process so we, we go through three areas we've got um, the think phase which is a strategy phase so we're using a, a cluster of ai tools now building our own gpt model where that pulls in um, the information we need to deliver strategy output, whether it be audience personas, market dynamics information, et cetera, et cetera, very quickly. So we'd be able to get the inputs that we need to inform the create phase, which is the creative, the ideation phase, you know, in minutes, hours, rather than weeks or days, weeks. So it just speeds up that process. We're also as a business, I mean, there's a big move in, 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 in the in the market as well around, you know, in terms of traditional agent, the traditional commercial agency model going from uh, time and resource uh, or time and materials, excuse me, into being more around uh, a kind of consultancy model and a productization model. So we're pivoting both together at the same time. Mm. Um, because that's what clients kind of expect and it's more value based. It's not, you know, you're still delivering a service, but the, the, you know, the premise of that service delivery, we will deliver this for you is we will actually create, we, we, we're going to bring benefit to you and value to you. Um, and that's, you know, that, that's the, 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 the vector we're on, but going back to it. So augmented creativity is about the careful chore choreographing of humans and AI. We're a human business, the human is a hero. What does that do? Say so it delivers benefits, so it delivers speed from a client perspective. It, it delivers speed, it delivers efficiencies, it delivers effectiveness. Um, for internally, what does it do? The benefit is time. Um, so, you know, our humans, our, our, our specialists uh, have more headspace to be more value additive uh, for our clients, so it reduces some of that kind of mandrolic process mm -hmm. stuff that you've got to do to be a, you know, a, a to deliver good service to the clients. But that can be kind of machine led. Um, obviously, then you interpret it. You need a human interface there to understand, depending on what it is. But if it's in in in, in a creative sense, bias uh, to make sure it's right uh etc cetera, etc cetera. but it but it enables us to yeah basically basically pivot to be what we call intelligent progress so and that's all about the intelligence comes from you know the, the fusion of amazing talent people capability craft experience curiosity empathy etc with progress which is how we we do it more efficiently deliver you know effectiveness and return on investment growth whatever that may be, but we will deliver pro, you know, progress through, the, through this, this, this engine. So it's a real blend of human intelligence and artificial intelligence. That's, yeah. that's what your company is, is, is doing now. It's understanding, you know, through that creative delivery process, what's important. Mm. Yeah, this, we, we had a, a, a process called evidence-based creativity. And what that does, it, you know, it's our proprietary process, but you know, any good agency will go through a similar thing where you start with interrogation of a client brief, you then look at um, the world, what we do anyway, through three lenses. So what, you, what you're trying to do is get audience insight to connect a brand and a brand truth with an audience. So, you know, for us, we, we look at market dynamics. So, you know, how a, a client is, what's the competitive advantage within that market for the client? What, where are well, the, you know, the reasons to believe in the truths? Where can they play in the white space to be as differentiated or more competitive? Then we look at the audience. So we use a lot of uh, data and insights tools to then go, right, do you really understand your audience, build personas, understand 
you know, psychographics, behavior, points of influence, media alignment, brand alignment, understand that, you know, the psychographics as well, you know, will, will inform tone of voice, et cetera, et cetera. Then we, we, then we want to look at the kind of landscape that sits behind both of those things. So that is the, the kind of change landscape. So what is happening environmentally, politically, ec economically, culturally, that will drive, you know, what should inform that, you know, a creative connect with, with a brand. You know, and we're, we're living, as say, in, in, in a world of turmoil at the moment, uncertainty. So we're worried about cost of living, we're worried about, you know, safety you know we're living about worried about lots of different things so but they inform you know the, what we then do from a creative perspective mm. now we've you know what we're doing now or we're using um different ai tools to output that information but actually now we're joining them up into clusters so we know what we need to inform creative and now we can get we can reduce the time um to do that can you share what AI tool you're using or is that a secret source? We're using a variety of them. Are there any, like if I'm listening to this, I'm like, cool, you're integrating AI. I want to learn from you. I want to integrate AI, AI into my business. Um, any tools you'd recommend and things, places to look? Yes. So again, you, you what we're doing is we're separating it into um, operations and then service delivery mm. so operations wise we're using like you're using super normal for instance you know mm. so contact reports used to take hours you know now it's look at it mate because the yeah super normal does get it tell people on. what super normal is so super normal as an example um sits on uh sits on meetings you know on teams or whatever and it will um transcribe the meeting mm. and it will then deliver meeting notes instantaneously after your meeting it needs the human interface to go through and make sure there's accuracy in there, but it will get you, you know, hypothetically to 90%, 95% yeah. of, of, of that capturing mm. accurately. And therefore a process in terms of a classic client service requirement of contact reporting the meeting can be done far faster. And therefore that client service representative who's been paid by the hour for the client on a project, it can now pivot their time to be more value additive. Mm. And that's, and a perfect example, actually, mm -hmm. of, 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 of how we, you can integrate certain AI tools into certain systems and functions. So mm -hmm. what we did is broke down what we do as an agency, operationally, systems, functions, found an AI tool for that, because there is an AI tool for that. And then we've built our own kind of AI tech stack. This is on an ops level, and then kind of integrated them as much as possible. So that kind of process and service delivery point of view from a business is... We, we're trying to reduce, you know, the human burden as much as we can there on a service level. Basis. And does it just stop there? Does it actually work or do you find yourself going, oh, it's not quite quicker, right. Quicker <laughs> to just do it ourselves, yeah. you know, we're just trying to tweak it and get it to work. How have you found that process? We haven't had, I don't think, um, this might just be in my, my little bubble. Um, I think it's been really positive. You know, it's been, it's been great. I mean, you've got to, that you, there's always a little teething phase to go through um uh but yeah it, uh, it's worth it there's, there's, you know so many different let me just talked about one thing that's the bane of of client service people's mm -hmm. lives contact reporting <laughs> done i'm yeah. reading it rather than writing it i'm slightly modifying it mm -hmm. might add a little bit of value into it as well but bang, there you go, job done, thank you very much. On to something that's... On to something else that can add more value, right? Exactly, be more pr productive. So, mm. yeah, if you break it down like that, as I say, we, what we've done is we've, we've broken our systems and processes and look where it will be for us value additive. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the service level, it's about, you know, again, we are... AI is available to everybody. So what we're doing on the service level in terms of creating our, you know, uh, AIing our... our our augmented creativity flow it, it isn't necessarily new, new, unique because you'll get creatives using mid journeys, your fireflies, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, your chat GBTs um, to you know look, develop mood boards, develop con you know rapid con uh, concepting. Um, we've used AI for a long time for uh, creative um, effectiveness. 
um, testing. So we, you, you test on a piece of creative cognitive demand and clarity. So we know it's, mm. you know, it's going to work pre going into, into market. So, you know, that's not particularly unique, but what we think is unique about the way we're doing it is we're daisy chaining it. So we're going from, you know, from strategy into, into, you know, concept and creative and then into implementation and then linking everything up mm -hmm. so it, it's all again using value additive a lot but it's creating it all through that data chain yeah how data driven how yeah how, how, how are we are doing that linking it all up so we're creating a uh a gpt that sits above other tools and it call and then it everything's about prompting right so mm -hmm. then it just calls in the re the information that that we need to then output at each point of the process, mm. the materials we do need. So, it, one, you know, in one area in the strategy phase, we need audience information. So we need in, you know, personas and insight. We can call that in, asking the right questions to the right AI tool, and or data and insights tool that has an AI API. So then call in what we need and then just go with it. Mm. I see. Takes the research out. Well, it takes the time to do that. Out. So yeah. You're utilizing uh, ChatGPT to build those personas, for example, rather than uh, based on real data that's out there, rather than um, having to go and do that yeah. research yourself. Yes and no. So we are using a GPT to then speak to different AI tools and then surface that information through these tools or data and insights providers um, and surface that information that how we want it. Yeah, that's one part of it. And then we are embedding within in business as well, that likes what we just talked about using the mid journeys, fireflies, the et cetera, et cetera, to then be able to do rapid mood boarding, rapid concept testing, you know, you, you know, etc etc Ra rapid creative benchmarking mm. um and it takes they're all things that are fundamental to delivering whatever it is you're delivering as and it could be creative or it could be strategy mm. um and so but the, but they are inherently time consuming so if you can speed that process up and you don't want to obviously cannibalize your you know your your cost base because that's not what we're doing but if you can free your creative teams up to have more th thinking time, challenge it more, craft it more, that's where the value comes. Yeah. I always see it kind of like what Google did to the yellow pages. Yeah, perfect. Right. Exactly. It's just a slightly different world we're in now where we're able to generate and retrieve information at such a speed and at such a such a um in such specifics that it can free us up. Ash, that's that's the perfect uh example actually because it all is just about surfacing information mm. in a in a convenient way in an intuitive and you know better way yeah yeah and it kind of shows where we're going i sit there with my two daughters six and three i had chat G gtp4 open i was like what do you want to do girls they're like what do you mean i was like should we make a poem should we make a picture naturally they wanted to do a unicorn okay a unicorn oh it's a bit too cartoony should we make it real yeah we made it real jumping over a rainbow they loved it and it's just like this is where we're at now it can be fun it can be helpful as long as you plug it into what you're doing it can save you time and um will save you time and keep you at the cutting edge of where we are yeah and i really do feel like it is a evolve will be extinct is always quite a harsh phrase but it does feel like that if you've got some people that will be doing prompts that save them two hours of work a day and you've got other people that are manually going through books or web pages copying pasting there's definitely a um, an advantage to the um the prompting way of doing it 100 percent, and yeah perfect examples as well where our point of view this is where the human's so important mm -hmm. is because of the interpretation of mm -hmm. that information and then what you do with it so you know our point of view is you cannot write or deliver brand creative through a prompt yet mm -hmm. because the, the most important thing about what we do or any creative agency should be doing is, is is creating a meaningful emotional connection between the brand and the target audience mm -hmm. what comes out is quite functional mm -hmm. 
um, you know, generally speaking. So it's it's down to the the specialist to be able to go right. That's going to get me to there faster, mm. which delivers value to our client, whether that be speed, your speed to market, you know, efficiencies, etc. Um, and then just and then put, layer the craft on. Mm. If I'm listening to this and I'm, I might be running a business or I might be a business leader or, and I'm thinking uh, AI is dan dangerous and I'm scared of what it will do to our industry, whatever industry that would be, what would you say to them? That's a big question. Um, they are so, right, macro world, irrespective of, the subject matter of you know a creative industry business agency whatever is that yeah i think there's a real kind of concern because you've got you know the the kind of concern about job markets um and and what what what's the effect on you know on certain job types and that, that's absolutely valid you've got the concern around bias in um in 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 ai I'm doing at the moment another course through Sci Business School, which the University of Oxford AI program, and it's fascinating. And the module we're on right now, actually, um, is around bias in machine learning. And bias can come from um, uh, who's op who's training the machine. So you know that that's going to come from education, culture. Um, socioeconomic group da, 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 da. so if you if you have bias when you're training a tool that's going to be come through it if you've got bias data that's going to come through it um, the machine is stupid you know, it's not because it's going to obviously learn but it is a machine it doesn't have you know the degrees of empathy that the, the, the human being would and, and understand cultural nuance unless it's trained. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it's really, you've got, yes, yeah, so you've got unconscious bias that just talked about, you've got conscious bias and you've got intended, you know, malicious activity where you could be training tools up and it's kicking out fake news and stuff like that. So there is a, that will obviously cause issues in society, could cause, you know, this is dramatic, you know, but you know, rewrite certain history facts, mm -hmm. da, 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 da. but you know what that is information. We all believe it. So, you know, that can, that can be, that could be really concerning. So, I mean, there will, but hence for policy and this, you know, and government to, to be able to, you know, make sure that, you know, the ethics of, of AI are, 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 are good. Do you think, is AI going to take over? Do you, do you think there is a, a possibility that and we should be concerned and aware of that we could get ourselves in a position longer term where we no longer have the power over AI that we do now and it starts to have the power over us? That's a really difficult question to ask. So, and you know, I'm reading uh, a book, I can't remember the guy's name now. Um, he's out of Google, but it's called Scary Smart and read it it's really interesting i'm not far enough into it for my own conclusions yet but there is a you know that there is there's truth in some of the in some of the fear you know that you talk about i hope as a you know a, a global population that we will you know act in a way that 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 you know that makes the the possibility of ai really powerful um Again, taking a step back to take a step forward, I, my personal belief is, and this is where we, why we're doing what we're doing, when you, you're faced with a kind of comparison like this is the fourth industrial revolution, you go and then GPT being general purpose technology. So a general purpose technology was electricity, you know, back in whatever mm. industrial revolution two or whatever. Um, I've got that wrong, but it's one of them. I think it's two. <laughs> um, and then you go right how do you see the adoption of electricity and what that the profound effect that it's had on on society so you had you know profound effect on on business profound effect on you know business industry 
and profound effect obviously on society and you know and you know to be a gpt it has to be pervasive it has to be um d deliver economic growth etc and then you know you're looking at ai as a gpt general purpose technology that will be pervasive because it, it kind of already is talking about it you know um doing stuff with your kids which is fantastic and it you know and it's perceived to be delivering economic growth great and if you know what the correlation between economic growth and life expectancy is more economic growth live longer better health so if you look at it on that lens then you go well it's, you know the possibilities are uh really positive so mm -hmm. i break it into that on a macro level on a micro level for us you know talks about it um it is having it's delivering benefit for us as a business that we can then tangibly deliver benefit for, for our clients so at this stage, you know, I think it's a positive thing, but 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 needs to be treated with respect on a kind of more macro and you know where stuff goes with media content, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, issues we have anyway. Mm. I saw yesterday with the the tech that's able to turn a photo into either a video or like a a lip sync. You can make a photo just kind of talk now and all that kind of stuff, which is that was I think it's Alibaba. Who Alibaba, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think Sora can do it as well cool yeah but also very dangerous because we may get to a point where you're not too sure what's real and what's not oh we're already there oh well, yeah sometimes. deep yeah. fakes to a degree, yeah. Yeah. deep fakes and stuff like that and um, which proposes just general issues in ways because if you don't know what's real then you could fall for anything don't you you're absolutely right and that that is that is a concern isn't it so you know the the the, the policing of it the regulation around it needs to be really tight um, you know, it's going to have an effect on, as you say, you know, media consumption, what you believe, what is real fact, what is real history, what is real any, what is a real person. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you see the, I forget what the name is, something AI, the Instagram um, bot that has a tremendous amount of yeah, followers yeah. and, you know, <laughs> making like loads of money on Insta. It's an AI, you know, so yeah. We, we we we're going to have to have different filters on ourselves mm -hmm. to then you know that we need to go through before we start believing stuff and then but then you go actually credible sources of you know more power to good media mm -hmm. you know so then you know broadcasters content producers etc you know there's a possibility that they become way more relevant they're very relevant anyway but you know, because they are sources of credibility that put the checks and balances in, and then maybe that's the way you go. Hang on, before I believe that, let's reference it over here. Mm. You know, so yeah. But we've got to, we've got to stop and think. Yeah, I think it, it's it is how you look at it. You know, and it it is helpful to view it as in an optimistic, positive manner that um, it can do great things and. And you do look back in history and you go, and you do see there are other times where this happened, where, you know, electricity came along and everybody was scared of that. And, oh, my gosh, it's going to do this or that. And and so it's, it seems hard to judge at this point whether we're just in that phase now and it'll just be normal and fine in the future. Or if do we need do need to be really concerned and put really strict measures in, in now? There's no right answer, I don't think. Um but it's good to be having the conversation is, I think, the important thing, isn't it? hundred percent. And it's, you talk about electricity, you know, the, the kind of danger of electricity is fire, electrocution. You know, it can have found effect on human life. So, again, but regulation, normalisation, you know, da, 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 da. we live in a world now where we go, what do you mean? It's a general purpose technology. It's just there. You know, so could AI become that? It's just just google on steroids in it isn't it really you know so i know that's really dominating it down but but it is you know served up data in a particular way um that is more actionable more rich you know going back to the course i was doing last year which was again you know pivotal in in terms of understanding for me you know where we now see the positive benefit of AI. There's a guy on this course that, that did similar things with his with his children. He'd write write me a story with my daughter in it, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, that, that's set in whatever, you know, it's like, and then you'd re read that story to them at bedtime. And it's like, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
so I don't know where we are. We we think it's a world of possibility. Um, it can, I know I'm banging on, but it can help you put efficiencies into your business. It can help deliver content richness. It can deliver, it can be educational. It can deliver, um, it can be fantastic for concepting and looking at the art of the possible before going to production and whatnot. It, it's, I think it's really, I think it's very rich. Can make, it can make unicorns. It can make, it unicorn, can make real unicorns. Ones. Ones. Yeah. Real exactly. ones. Yeah. <laughs> so you've mentioned it there. I think I want to, we want to end on a very human point, which is what this podcast is a lot about, is the human side of life. So one of the final questions of today is, how do you approach supporting your children so that they can live the life that's best for them? I like to think um, that, you know, trying to create a kind of domestic culture, just to let them do what they want to do, empower them to be who they want to be, and, you know, give them the possibility to dream. Um that anything's possible, you know, you know, um, so just be, who, you know, be a good person, do the right things, think big mm. yeah, and, um, and, and follow your dreams, you know, so if you're passionate about things, I think two things happen there. One, you'll be fulfilled and it's hugely important. doesn't matter what you do, be fulfilled. And the other one is if you're passionate about what you do, you tend to do it better and then you tend to be more successful. Mm. So it's finding that, I think, you know, as a father and, and, and you know, yeah, enabling them to find it is, if, you know, be the, be the pe people they want to be, as long as they're kind, as long as they think big, they'll, they'll be all right. What, what are your kids' names? Sam and Tom. Sam and Tom, there you go. There's the message, Sam and Tom. And uh, are you proud of Sam and Tom? I'm very proud of Sam and Tom. Don't tell them all the time. But um, particularly when they're leaving stuff all over the house. But um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm very proud of Sam and Tom. I mean, they are, you know, they they yeah, they're amazing kids, and you know, they they keep myself and my wife on our toes all the time, and they surprise us all the time, and they see the world in a different way, which is amazing, and so it can be quite enlightening as well. Um, I just wish they'd uh, not leave their clothes around the house, <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, so after they've tied their clothes away, what are you proud of about them? I'm proud of so many things. I'm proud of them just for being who they are. You know, they. How old are they? Just to get they're, the they're, 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 they're twelve and ten. Mm -hmm. so, so Sam, for instance, has gone just gone to secondary school, and so that that kind of change is is because obviously you live fears, right? As a parent, and, you, know, you have this different level of consciousness now. They're, they're your biggest point of vulnerability, um, and then you've got to. A bit like taking leaps of faith in business, um, you've got to let them just crack on and be who they want to be and define their own identity and try not to suppress it. And you know, daydreaming is, is good. You know, daydreaming can be a little bit annoying sometimes when you've got to go get a train, mate. But um, but you know, daydreams when they're forming their own creative thought processes, and so you can't suppress creativity. You know, da da da. But um, yeah, so Sam's gone to secondary school. He you know now gets on a train to go to school, you know, he could barely navigate a door, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, you know, in the summer. And now we've got to go, oh yeah, it's fine, get on a train, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very proud of, you know, he's just gone in terms of his maturity. Um, youngest one, they're both dyslexic by the way. So they've, you know, they have, again, you know, learning difficulties and systems and processes that they've got to put into place for themselves. And they're, they're, they're excelling irrespective of, of that, which can be a superpower, but it's a hindrance as well. well that's what we're going to say. Yeah. Through this show, we've learned what a superpower having dyslexia is. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Phil Thomas, who's CEO or was CEO of Can Lines, now CEO of Essential, the, the, the holding company. Um, Zavris, gl uh, group CEO of AMV, BBDO. They never didn't realize it when they were younger and it seemed like a hindrance then. But as they've gone through their career and we're in a different time now, they they can look back and go, wow, this is the thing that actually makes me unique and makes me really good at this, this and this. And that's why I've been able to become CEO because I'm dyslexic. So it's this great superpower. Um, 
if you're given that encouragement and 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 clarity to see what it unlocks which is really cool totally agree i mean for our kids we got them you get you have a they get a review person in i can't quite remember what the right terminology is but anyway you they, they do like a review of your child's behavior and stuff like that and both of them are dyslexic and which probably means i'm dyslexic because apparently if one of you parents is dyslexic you've got a 50 percent chance that a kid's going to be dyslexic mm. so if you've got two dyslexic kids probably means wife and myself dyslexic i can remember school pre-diagnosis of these things i had learning difficulties and then what you do is you put systems and processes in place to make sure that you can keep up be on time do whatever um and then that's what they're going through now you know it is fantastic that it is uh understood because people are like for instance growing up i'm very visual um so i'd need to be can you show me what you mean please you know rather don't tell me because i I'm just gone show me you know so that was my learning requirement and i didn't know that i didn't get it until i was older you know but now if if you can understand that actually that's more suitable to you because of how your brain works then you can yeah accept it use it be a superpower but just understand who you are which is fantastic because it's completely normalized well there we go um that is the story of how you became CEO and founder of the Amigo Partnership and the story of Amigo Partnership, which, uh, again, it's great to hear um, that journey you've been on, on, on um, finding that happiness once again in what you do. Um, so you. now we are here for the final poem. Set a target and follow passion. Success could be your future destination. By looking in from the outside, you can bring solutions that can surpass expectation. Networking and enabling clients, a few tips for ongoing success. The power of face-to-face -face meetings to keep relationships strong and fresh. Let purpose be your driver, more than small change and fivers. Your actions will reflect your true vision. Even when it may seem strange, you might be called to switch lanes when the fun times have turned into a prison. What are you good at? And where are your talent gaps? Questions to be a fully bodied force. To listen, to recognize, be supported and celebrated. Values that can keep you up front with the torch. Brilliant. Two poems in one day. Thank you for joining us today. Cheers. Thank you, guys. At the start of this day, no one had ever written a poem about you. <laughs> exactly. And now you have two. Two. <laughs> <laughs> one for each pocket. There you go. Cheers, guys. All right. Thanks very much.